Hello and welcome. We are now in the session FOP Oral Health Implications and Treatment Approaches. I'm Michelle Davis, Executive Director of the IFOPA, and we're thrilled to have so many people joining us today from around the world. It's already been a busy morning. There's been trivia, the um, very um, highly anticipated uh, tr common questions of healthcare professionals panel, and then we just had a great session on self-care and resilience and living life the Hawaiian way. So if you uh, missed especially the common health questions uh, panel this morning, you'll want to go back. You can listen to that for 90 days since you're registered for the gathering and make sure that you listen to that again. So today we are going to be talking this afternoon with, uh, or in the morning, it depends on where you are in the world, but with Dr. Um, Eleanor Booby uh, Behrens and then also uh, Dr. Tone also with us today um, about uh, oral health uh, implications and some different treatment approaches. So um, Dr. Eleanor, you may have heard of before. She has um, been to other FOP family gatherings. She's a senior consultant in, in special care dentistry, and she's a clinical director for the special care dentistry program in Rotterdam, um, Amsterdam, uh, is where she's based out of. And then also with us today is Dr. Tone Schoenmaker, and he is a PhD uh, scientist at the Academic Center for Dentistry, and he's in the P Department of Periodontology, and he's there in Amsterdam. So they have um, worked on FOP and worked with FOP families for a long time, and they're here to share um, some of their knowledge with you today. Before we get started, I just wanted to uh, offer a few housekeeping items. First of all, if you are needing live translation that is occurring today through our KUDO app, and you will see the KUDO app button on the right of your screen. So click on that and it will start both Spanish and Portuguese translations. There are other uh, virtual uh, artificial intelligence translations that are available to you today as well for our Wordly app. So you'll see the Wordly button that is offering translation in 25 different languages. And so when you click on the button, that will start that translation. Um, we do hope that you'll use the chat function, also the button on the right to say hello and to share where you're from. It's been fun over the last two, day and a half to watch people from around the world joining us. And then there is time allotted for questions and answers, but we don't need, want you to put those in the chat. They may get lost in the chat amongst the other discussions. So there is a Q&A button. So make sure you select that Q&A button to insert your questions. If we can answer it during the session um, on the screen, we will. Otherwise, we will ask that question and allow Dr. Eleanor and Dr. Tone to um, respond at the end of their sessions. So with that, we're going to start off today with a special video uh, clip that um, uh, Dr. Eleanor uh, shared that uh, we'd like to show to begin with. And it is um, from a uh, movie that we hope that many of you are familiar with, a special documentary project called Tin Soldiers. And uh, Dr. Eleanor shared these thoughts. I'm always fascinated and impressed by the wonderful documentary film, Tin Soldiers. I keep seeing and hearing new images and statements that touch my heart deeply. When I was asked to speak together with Tone Schoenmaker at the family gathering, the results of this, his research on jaw movement limitation and FOP, Whitney immediately came to mind, and Whitney Weldon is featured in the video that you're about to see the clip. In Ten Soldiers, Whitney explains beautifully and penetratingly that maintaining mobility in the concrete jungle on four wheels, eating out at her favorite restaurants because she can still open her mouth, means quality of life for her. So uh, Dr. Eleanor asked uh, the Ten Soldiers production team, Odette Schwegler and Amanda Cowley, to make a short video that features uh, Whitney that talks a little bit about how important it is to be open, able to open your mouth literally and figuratively. And as soon as the video clip finishes, then we will meet uh, Dr. Eleanor and Dr. Tone, and you'll hear more about their interactions with patients and the research that they're conducting around FOP and oral health in the jaw. As I'm getting older and as FOP is progressing, I don't take walking for granted, using my right arm and being able to open my jaw. And those are the three things that really I have left to that I can use.
She gets dressed, does her hair, she does a little makeup. Her caregiver puts her in that wheelchair and she is off and going on her own, everything New York. I started an Instagram account that goes through New York and looks at different places that are wheelchair accessible, either restaurants, coffee shops, or other stores, and I'll document it with pictures and text. Concrete jungle on four wheels. So travelers and tourists of New York know that if they have a dis disability or are handicapped, in any way that they can still go to these delicious restaurants. I can't even imagine how many miles Whitney has done on her wheelchair independently. <laughs> I have to take every day as it comes and really appreciate the things I do have. FOP is all about adaption and with the unknown progression, every day is a new opportunity to have learned new tools on different ways to make my life more independent. I don't go throughout my days thinking that I have FOP and when scary moments happen, that's when you get slapped in the face. That's the scary thing about FOP, is that sometimes are no warning signs, because no one really understands what we go through. So it's like living with a terrorist in the, in the house. You never know when that terror is gonna strike again. It could be tomorrow, it could be a month from now, it could be a year from now, it could be five years from now, but you know, that something is gonna happen. And I really don't know what would happen if I lost the ability. <laughs> if I lost the ability to walk. Looking at an adult with FOP is like going to the World Trade Center it's a memorial to something that happened. It's a memorial to the people that suffered and died there. And one can look at that site and say, intellectually, a terrible terrorist attack occurred here. My hope is that people learn from it and learn that life's going to be OK. Good uh, morning or evening or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm uh, uh, Tom, I'm uh, from Holland, so for me it's uh, the afternoon. And in the coming hour or so, we'd like to uh, tell you something more about uh, the limitations of jaw movements and oral care in, uh, in FOP. Um, sorry, I'm losing the screen here. There we go. Uh, let me please introduce myself uh, first. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Schoenmaker. I'm a cell biologist. Uh, I work at the Academic Center for Dentistry in the beautiful city of, uh, of Amsterdam. Uh, and I work at the Department of Periodontology. Um, I became involved in the FOP research uh, in, the, in 2017. Uh, and that was because of um, a limitation of jaw movement of one of the patients uh, in Holland. Uh, this pa patient had a near zero uh, ma maximum mouth opening. And you can imagine that that severely uh, inhibited uh, normal day life. Uh, and that ne nearly zero mouth opening was because of the bony bridge that you that you see here at the, at the arrow uh, that prevented the, the jaw from, uh, from opening. Uh, and it was decided that this patient uh, would undergo an operation to remove that bony bridge. Uh, and during that operation, also some of the teeth had, had to be uh, removed. 
And uh, the team of uh, uh, Marilise Eekhoff knew that we at the dentistry department in Amsterdam uh, are able to isolate cells from, from these uh, teeth that play a role in uh, both bone formation and bone degradation. Uh, and that's how we or I myself became involved in FLP uh, research. Um, because uh, what we can do is uh, when we have extracted teeth, we can isolate cells from those uh, teeth and they are called the periodontal, periodontal ligament fibroblasts. Now, the Periodont, uh, the, the periodontal ligament is the ligament, a very small space that is housed between the tooth root and the uh, and the jaw bone. Uh, and at the moment that um, uh, that you extract teeth, the the the, the cells the, uh, that are connected to that, the, the fibroblasts that are residing in this periodontal ligament, they uh, also come uh, come loose, and we can isolate these cells. And the very good thing of these periodontal ligament fibroblasts is that they have a dual function because they are both um, uh, involved in in bone formation uh, as well as bone degradation and actually we use these cells a lot in the in the research in periodontitis periodontitis is the disease uh, that characterizes itself by finally uh, a, a strong degradation of the of the jaw bone because of which uh, teeth fall out uh, and we use these periodontal ligament fibroblasts uh, in uh, in uh, periodontal uh, ligament or uh, in periodontitis research uh, but as said uh, Marilise Ekov realized that, uh, that we might also use these uh, these fibroblasts in FOP research. Um, and coming back to this very uh, intriguing dual function uh, of these fibroblasts, because of which we can use them so very nicely in uh, in bone related research, um, you can imagine at the moment that uh, there is a, a, an orthodontic force. So at the moment that pe the people have have a brace uh, and uh, an orthodontic force is applied on on the tooth, then in the direction where the tooth has to move, you need bone degradation. And in the direction where the tooth com comes from, you need bone formation uh, in order to fill the gap that's uh, that's coming there. And both these processes are being orchestrated by these uh, wonderful periodontal ligament fibroblasts. Uh, at the site of the bone degradation, these fibroblasts attract the, the cells that, that, that break down the bone. And at the other side, uh, where the bone uh, needs to be formed, these periodontal ligament fibroblasts actually are able to form the bone itself. Now, you all know that one of the problems that, uh, that people face in, uh, in FOP research is that we, uh, that we uh, don't have access to, to bone of, of, of the patients, because at the moment you remove that, there's a very big chance that you get very uh, big bone formation back there. Uh, so there is a lack of cells that are involved in bone metabolism, let's say, so bone, bone formation and bone degradation, uh, to do research with. And now with these periodontal ligament fibroblasts that we can isolate at the moment that a tooth is it's extracted. We finally um, have a, uh, a cell biological tool in the, uh, to, to, to study these cells in the lab. So when teeth have to be extracted, and that happens every now and then for several reasons, uh, we are able to, to, to isolate these periodontal ligament fibroblasts from the tooth root of these cells. These cells can easily be cultured so we can expand them so we have millions and millions of cells that we can, that we can store uh, in the lab and we can, uh, and we can do um, research on them and once again the good thing about these fibroblasts is that they play a role in bone both bone formation and bone degradation uh, which is something that we want to know uh, more about uh, what is going on with that in um, in fop uh, over the past few years, we've been using these cells uh, in our lab to, uh, to, to study different things. We have been looking at uh, a gene expression in these cells from patients uh, when active in A uh, is present. We have been uh, looking at um, uh, the, the influence of these cells on the, on the bone uh, degradating cell, uh, cells called osteoclasts, um, et cetera, et cetera. So over the past few years, we've been doing pretty basic fundamental uh, cell biological research using these cells, hoping to finally gain more insight what goes exactly wrong, what exactly goes wrong on the, on the cell biological and molecular level uh, in, uh, in FOP. But apart from that, uh, at the dentistry department, we are obviously also uh, very interested in, uh, in, in what goes on um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the problems with the jaw movement. Uh, as you probably all know, um, in the end, about 70% of FOP patients finally uh, uh, experience uh, uh, limitations of jaw movement, uh, very often uh, uh, resulting in a, uh, in a zero millimeter jaw movement, meaning a completely closed jaw. Um, and what we wanted to know is what actually 
is known about the causes of these uh, of, of this limitation of the of, of the jaw movements. Um, and what we did is we uh, we did a review. What we basically did is we took all the literature that has been published on uh, on FOP uh, connected to jaw movement impairment. We went back all the way to 1982 until until now, and we put all the, those data together in uh, uh, and hoped to to find out if we could find a general cause or something uh, that pops up uh, in, in in all that literature. Um, what we basically found, um, two of the most important things on that, uh, uh, on that uh, research, was that um, uh, trauma-induced bone formation occurs at a younger age compared to spontaneously occurring bone formation. Um, now, that sounds logical um, because children uh, uh, tend to play and maybe they fall. And even the, uh, at the moment that they fall and they, they hit their... their their jaw area, then they can, uh, then uh, heterotopic bone formation can can take place there. Um, but it is still important to to realize that this is happening at a younger age. Uh, and the second important thing that we found in in this review is that it matters actually where. Uh, in which muscles uh, of the of the jaw uh, area are involved in the heterotopic bone formation? Uh, some muscles have a more severe uh, final net result in the in the in the mouth opening uh, than uh, than other muscles. So this whole review basically. Um, uh, has clinical uh, implications. Uh, I'm not a clinician. I'm a cell biologist. But Eleanor here next to me, she is a clinician, and she will uh, tell you a lot more about the clinical implications of this uh, of this review that we did. Here is Eleanor. Uh, thank you, Tom. So I'm now in view, and I have I really enjoy this uh, joint presentation together with Tom. And as a former dentist in special care dentistry, I feel really privileged to continue this presentation. And I dedicated my professional life to the dental care for patients with a disability in the most fascinating town in the Netherlands, Rotterdam. And there's always a sort of rivalry between the people from Amsterdam and Rotterdam. We always say you go to Amsterdam for history and fun. And you go to Rotterdam for the hard workers and the feeling like living at Manhattan at the River Mass. In this referral center for special care dentistry, I have treated special patients in all age groups. And due to the proximity of the Erasmus University uh, Hospital, we see many patients with rare syndromes and complex needs. And that's how my connection with FOP started. My connection has been Stefan, my dental patients for many, for many years. And he shared his feelings and problems with me and told me about living with FOP. He really teached me about FOP. And he told me about this fantastic trip in the year of 2000, where he was invited by uh, uh, oh yeah, by uh, thank you, uh, by IFOPA to visit the laboratory of Fred Kaplan and Eileen Shaw, and that's how I came into the FOP community in the Netherlands, talking about dental issues at the family gatherings of the uh, Dutch FOP Foundation, and as from 2016. I am the chairperson of the patient organization, the Dutch FOP Foundation. And as I learned more and more about FOP, I could take up my role as a dental professional in the FOP research community in the Netherlands, leading to my participation in the recently published article on the jaw problems and FOP. And just a few months ago, uh, I presented uh, together with Clive Friedman, and you know him all, and a young uh, dentist, uh, um, uh, prosthodontist from Paris. Together, we present. We had a webinar of an, uh, a workshop on um, fibro on FOP, and talking about the research of Tom, talking about clinical issues, and so we raised awareness among our dental professionals on this very rare syndrome. And it was a fantastic, a, a very nice experience. Back to the research by Tom. 
He already told uh, you about his uh, research pre project, a literature review uh, done by two uh, dental students and with an amazingly result of 725 publications uh, ended into 30 studies uh, uh, included in the study and uh, uh, 94 pa FOP patients described and a lot of data were gained from that research. What we have learned from this literature to, uh, study is that what causes and what impact, what are the consequences of uh, heterotopic uh, ossification, the formation of extra bone uh, in, um, and the impact in the lim uh, jaw limitations uh, and thus the limited mouth opening. So, it is specifically trauma or infection which influences the formation of extra bone. And I will talk to you about it later. But also overstretching the jaw, <coughs> which will happen when you have to go to the dentist. And we really have to learn our dental professionals never, never to use a mandibular anesthetic block and I will talk to you about it later. And also oral surgeons has to be very careful when resection, uh, when they take off uh, extra bone. The impact of all this is that, as Ton already told, the mouth opening will gradually decrease if to zero, which means that food intake, oral hygiene, or dental treatment become more and more difficult. Patients report a fear of vomiting, with a difficult word, emetophobia, and we see a severe loss of weight in, pers in patients with FOP with a very restricted mouth opening. So we really see the very uh, negative consequences on quality of life of people with FOP. And again, this picture that Ton already showed you, and I zoom in on the in the on the maximum mouth opening. The average mouth opening for females in the normal uh, population is 45 millimeters. For male, this is 50 millimeters. When mouth opening decreases below 20 millimeters, no oral hygiene is possible. You cannot. A toothbrush cannot go into the mouth. Uh, this old that sort of functions become brushing the teeth, and the inside of the, the the teeth will be more and more difficult. And it even can close on, uh, to zero millimeter, which make dental treatment and making finding dental solutions for patients more and more difficult. And let us take a closer look uh, to the relation between the location of the extra bone and the mouth opening. And you see their big difference. Uh, if we look at the horizontal X, you see there the different structures of uh, in the oral facial region. The, and I will show to this, you this uh, more in detail in the next slide. And in the vertical X, you see the mouth opening in millimeters. And there you see that the biggest influence is when extra bone is for, formed within the masseter muscle. And um, I go to the next slide. And don't be afraid of this picture. Don't put off by this picture. I'm going to explain. Here you see at the, at, uh, the, the, the location of extra bone as described in the last picture, now you understand why bone formation between the ascending branch of the lower jaw and the jaw, the the yolk, ne the jaw, ne how do that? The zygoma, uh, the yolk bone. Yeah, I, I I'm used to the technical descriptions. Sorry for that, but you can imagine that when bone formation, bone bridges are formed within this region, there will more and more be a situation of total trismus of the mouth, which is dramatic. 
In the next slide, you see two different, uh, the, the most important muscles. First, the masseter muscle. And he is, this muscle plays an enormous function in our chewing function, in our chewing and the pressure we can, uh, the, the pressure we can um, exert with the masseter. And it plays an important role with opening the mouth. And then next, these two big muscles, the lateral and medial pterygoids muscle, have an important role in opening and closing of the mouth. Now you better can understand this picture in which is said that the masseter, that extra bone in this muscle, gives the lowest, uh, the, the most um, uh, strongest mouth, or mouth opening restriction. Then followed by the pterygoid muscle, as I gave you, uh, and then there you see the, the, the bridge bone between the ascending branch of the lower jaw and the, the yolk ball. So what, can the, what are the conclusions that we can draw from this review, as already said by Tom? We know that extra bone, uh, trauma-induced extra bone, uh, occurs at a younger age. And it is understandable, but younger children, they fall, they are, are going more, uh, probably go more often to the dentist. Uh, and there are questions about the orthodontic treatment and the risk for extra bone. But based on this conclusion, I think it is important that dentists should be very careful while treating young patients with FOP. And looking at the other conclusion, that trauma, specifically in the masseter and the pterygoids, should be avoided since the extra bone at these sites results in the smallest mouth opening, as I said before. And these findings are very important for the clinical guidelines for the dental management of FOP patients. And I assume that you are all familiar with these guidelines for medical management at FOP established by the International Clinical Council on FOP. And I'm sure that Clive, together with Clive, I will work, uh, we will try to incorporate the results of this research in the FOP oral health guidelines. And also inform your dentist to look at these ICC guidelines. There are very important recommendations for dentists in how to take care and be very careful with in their treatment of FOP patients. But also, let's look to ourselves, to uh, the lessons that can be drawn from this research uh, for the patients and for the dentist. But let's first look at us ourselves as FOP patients. How do we prevent teeth from being affected by tooth decay or how we keep our gums healthy? In other words, how we keep our, our health, maintain our, our health. And the key to success is, of course, as Clive Friedman always says, prevention. We know how important um, so, and these basic rules of oral self-care are, in principle, not very complicated. Brush your teeth carefully twice a day with a fluoride toothpaste and moderate your sugar intake. Because it's all about preventing tooth decay, which is the most common dental disease, but it is still a very tricky problem and it is virtually impossible to solve. First, we thought that it was caused by the disturbed interaction between tools, plaque, and diet, but now we see it as a symptom of lifestyle problems like obesity, obesity overweight, unhealthy diet, smoking, alcohol, and also factors such as education, Environment, behavior, and knowledge also play an important role in this 
in this regard. Unfortunately, we again seeing we are again seeing an increase in tooth decay among the youth. And a few years ago, we had a research in the Netherlands in which it became clear that a five-year-old child eats his own weight of sugar every year. That's amazing. That's frightening. My gentle message to all of you today, please, please limit your intake of candies and especially all sorts of energy drinks. But do enjoy chocolates and bonbons or Belgian pralines because we only live once and we have to some, have some joy in life, isn't it? For the dentist, there is the, the holy grail, the first do no harm, prim non notre. Dentists should think before they act. Dentists are very keen in doing very quickly interventions. They really do have to think before. And as a, as a dentist, uh, as I have worked with so many patients with a disability, I know how important it is to have a good positioning of the patient in the dental chair. There are a lot of solutions you can find with cushions, with uh, devices, to make the dental chair, the dentist should discuss together with you the way to make the dental chair more comfortable for you. Very important, lengthy dental uh, treatments should be avoided. Uh, dentists have to find a solution to cut a treatment in several sessions, short sessions, and to, to discuss that with you. And they never should ask you to open your mouth further. Exceeding the maximum mouth opening is a real trigger for a start of maybe extra bone. And as dentists, we know that reduced jaw movements leads to a less salivary flow, which in itself can lead to the risk of tooth decay. We should take care of that. And a mandibular block anesthesia is also mentioned in the review of, uh, of in the research for Ton. Very often, a mandible block anesthesia has been the origin of restricted mouth opening in FOP. And this is for me very important. Any dental patient with FOP should be able to undergo dental treatment painlessly. Careful pain relief is a top priority. And therefore, I'm going to explain to you the different procedures of local anesthesia in dentistry. And finally, I'm going to tell you something about orthodontics in FOP. Now, I'm going to give you a crash course on local anesthesia. Don't be scared. Here are the four procedures when applying a local anesthetic in dentistry. Which technique is safe in FOP and what is the absolute no-go area in FOP? I go to, through the infiltration, intraligamentary, intraosseous mandibular block. Don't be afraid you do not have a local anesthesia today from me. Uh, this is the most classical method. This anesthetic procedure can be applied in places where the jawbone is rather thin, near the tooth or molar. So it's a sort of regional anesthesia where the, the needle, the puncture is in the deep part of the fold of the cheek. So this is the fixed uh, gingiva and this is loose, uh, not, it is mucosa. Huh? Yeah. Mucosa, yes. So this is uh, loose tissue and this is fixed gingival mucosa. And at this fold, there the injection is given, and so the anesthesia solution can spread in that region. This is very most often applied to all teeth and molars in the upper jaw and in the lower jaw only to the teeth and the premolars because it is not effective in the molar region. 
A newer technique is the single tooth anesthesia. And the injection of the anesthetic solution is directly into the alveodental ligament in the tooth socket. So here, here is the position in which a very short needle in this uh, specially developed uh, syringe in which under a certain pressure, uh, uh, local anesthesia deposit is placed directly into the socket. It gives a single tooth anesthesia, uh, immediate and effective in one single tooth. The problem is that the pressure during injection can be painful. And it would be nice to hear from maybe some FOP patients how they have experienced this type of local anesthesia. A newer technique is now the intraligamentary anesthesia, the single tooth anesthesia with a computer controlled local anesthesia delivery. It looks like a medical equipment with a very small needle and uh, it is with this equipment, with this device, the liquid, the anesthesia liquid is um, uh, when we not administered drop by drop, computer controlled through a very small needle. So it is less frightening than applying an anesthetic with a traditional syringe. And with this procedure, you can very precisely numb one tooth without, for example, uh, your tongue or lower lip also being numbed. This is very uh, popular in pediatric dentistry. And here you see the position of the of this uh, the small needle in also in the tooth socket. A new method recently is now anesthesia with the quick sleeper, control, computer-controlled intraosseous anesthesia. Intraosseous means into the bone. And the method is named to the equipment, the quick sleeper. And it is an electronic pen. So they describe it as an electronic pen that efficiently and comfortably performs dental anesthesia, including osteocentral anesthesia. The problem is, it has not been tested in FOP patients for its safety. The technique in itself is effective, but is it safe? And I would like to have some oral surgeons around me to make this clinical research because it can be so effective uh, and, and therefore very good in, this FOP, in our FOP patient group. Here you see more in detail the technique in which the controlled, computer controlled anesthetic is applied directly to the jawbone with an, one prick uh, into the bone. And through that hole, as um, uh, the an anesthetic liquid is applied around the tooth. So, and it is. Uh, also, it has a, a huge advantage that it looks like a pen, and so that it has no association with a, a conventional anesthetic syringe. And also, very important, tongue, cheek, and lip are not anesthetized. And also, there's also a rather disadvantage. It's a quite expensive device, but became very popular. The mandibular nerve doc, uh, conduction, so the, the mandibular block anesthesia, is often used in dental treatment for the molar region. But this form of anesthesia can form cause trauma to the muscles, as I already told you, because here we have the pterygoid, we have the masseter muscle here. So with this needle, you can damage these muscles. Uh, these muscles. So here you see the risk for flare-ups extra bone formation and a restricted mouth opening, which means this is really a no-go, pardon, a no-go area, a no-go area in FOP. So I resume, infiltration anesthesia, in general, it can be used. 
in FOP patients. We, we have uh, experience with the intraligamentary anesthesia, whether it is by uh, the, the, control, the computer controlled or in other, with other devices, we don't know yet about intraosseous anesthesia, and this is forbidden, a no-go area. Never yeah. allow your dentist to give you a mandibular block. Oh, there is the red arrow I was <coughs> looking for. And I would like to end my presentation with a new technique, the digital, the digital intraoral scanning and its possible applications in treatment planning in FOP. Astrid was a willing test patient in this trial we conducted in Amsterdam in 2016. And later on, I will say something about new developments in orthodontics. And this was the result of that trying trial project. We were now, because it would have been impossible to make the traditional impressions uh, in, for, in, uh, for, uh, with Astrid uh, for making uh, models and to study the, the, the occlusion and, well, how her lower jaw and upper jaw were connected to each other. So it was an enormous... Um, a uh, beautiful model to for brainstorming, for treatment planning, uh, for uh, trying to find the correct devices for oral hygiene, and also for orthodontics. And thanks to the the new developments in the digital intraoral scanning, uh, we could do something about we can think about risks of the orthodontics when we uh, use the traditional orthodontic treatment with fixed appliances, with brackets and wires, where, uh, where we do not know yet uh, which forces are applied for tooth mo movement. In the ICC, uh, in the guidelines, it is said that uh, orthodontic treatment can be a safe safely performed. However, insight in the relation between the applied forces and tooth movement are still lacking. So quite possibly such forces on muscles and ligaments could induce extra bone in that area. And that's a risk. But now we have the new world of braces treatment with Invisalign braces. You might have heard about it be almost invisible braces. Thanks to the intraoral scanning technique, it is now possible to make aligners, transparent braces, a set of transparent braces, which can lead with uh, the, the, the tooth movement to from the original spot to the desired spot. And uh, that will give that the, the forces that are used in this technique are less, are far less than in the traditional orthodontic treatment. So it can be very interesting for the FOP uh, population. But you have to wear, you have, uh, you have to wear uh, the braces for at least 20 to 22 hours a day and only remove the braces when eating, drinking, brushing your teeth and flossing. What are the, the advantages? There are a lot of advantages. 
the hygiene is not compromised or complicated by fixed brackets, which is always very difficult for a patient to clean their mouth with all the brackets. Uh, the intraoral scanning instead of the traditional impression taking. Uh, the handling of the braces are much easier for parents and caregivers. So it's more comfortable for the patients. You have no repairs. And because you can on the, on the computer, you can uh, predict the result which, uh, of the orthodontic treatment, which is very motivating for the patient. But also there are disadvantages. It has to be worn day and night and a liner's head to take out for eating. And here again, I say more research is uh, needed. I hope that we have bring more insight to you in what has been the clinical uh, consequences of the research that Ton and his team has done in the last few years. I think it is, was an exciting journey for me to participate in that journey. And I would say, absolutely, this is the summer in the Netherlands, and we were there happily ever after here. After, <laughs> And thank you for your attention on behalf of Tom, and we are ready to take your, action, your, your questions. Okay, great. Thank you for, first of all, just showing the research and for doing the research and then sharing with that with us and the findings, understanding how FOP impacts patients around the world is always really important for patients to hear about and for families to hear about. So thank you, Tone, for your research. And then for Eleanor, for walking us through the implications of that research, and then what some of the options are for people living with FOP. So we are very grateful um, for the time that you dedicate to our community. We do have a few questions that have come in, so I'm going to start with the first one. Um, I think this is for Eleanor about, can you share your thoughts on um, hydroxyapatite toothpaste versus fluoride toothpaste? I may not have said the first word correctly, so I apologize. <laughs> Uh, in general, it's the fluoride uh, toothpaste we are recommending. Okay. So that, that is the, well, the basic guideline. But to know exactly what you need, you, could talk, you should talk to a dental hygienist because they can give a very individual advice on, because you ha we have a lot of different toothpaste. There's a lot of new research going on. There are new developments also in toothpaste so i have left it out of this uh, uh, presentation but talk to your dental hygienist or dentist because a lot of new things developments are in this field okay and then can you also share do you have anything you can share about laser dentistry oh my god to treat to treat uh to do cavity work i believe it is yeah um, well, I think that at the moment that is not very uh, much applied in the Netherlands. Well, there are uh, new techniques of um, uh, the, uh, making a cavity without drilling, uh, but that is our our new. Of oh, that's not a new technique, but that can only be used in. Uh, very specific situations. Um, restorative dentistry with laser. Uh, I'm, I know about it. I never did it myself. So I should ask uh, a specialist on that in that field. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so one of the questions is about the concern about the problem of vomiting while the jaw with limited jaw opening. So maybe you could talk a little bit about some strategies that you've seen patients um, use to, to deal with just the physical function of that, but then also the, the mental anxiety of living with, with that. I think that um, what we heard about, and we know uh, from several patients that that's really a mental issue for them they are very frightened to uh, uh, 
have to suffocate to vomiting. So, and it depends on how the closure of the mouth is. And there is also, we think about maybe a new strategy for extracting uh, not the, the most posterior uh, molars, but maybe uh, some uh, teeth uh, in the middle of the, the arch to give room for that sort of situations when the patient is very anxious about that sort of situation. But it is real for this patient, it's a severe problem. Uh, we should, as dental professionals, think about how we can help patients uh, in this fear. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, then the next question is about um, whether or not you recommend the use of an electric toothbrush. The what? Of an electric well, toothbrush? Oh yeah, I have new. I have new information from Paris. Oh, good. <laughs> well, we always said. Well, we know from uh, studies that in the general population, the, uh, the electric toothbrush is more effective than the hand brush. Uh, in uh, Paris, I heard about a huge uh, study from Ireland and the UK, in which it said that for people with a disability, so people with restricted uh, abilities to brush their mouth, whatever the reason is, there is no difference between electrical toothbrush and the uh, the the common how we call it the the the, the, the traditional manual. The, the manual thank you uh, but i think that for myself well the problem with electrical toothbrushes is sometimes are very heavy so not easy to handle for an fop patients the brushes itself are very often too too big uh, so i think I don't mind how you brush your teeth, if you brush your teeth, and do it at least twice a day, and try to do it whatever you can, and just don't take too much candies. So, but, you know, but also here, uh, when you have questions about uh, your specific an individual advice on oral hygiene is so important. And I know that I have worked together with the dental hygienist of, of, the, of ACTA in Amsterdam, and she is fantastic. And they know a lot about it. Talk about it, think about it. But if I have brought some awareness uh, for you that it is so important to clean your mouth, I'm happy today. <laughs> Yeah. And a related question to that, is it recommended that people living with FOP see their dentist a little more frequently than yes. other people? Yes, yes. And I would say that uh, I don't know how it is. Well, I, in the Netherlands, the, the recommendation is that you take your child uh, from uh, when it is two years old to the dentist. So, and then you have all the children's dentistry um, uh, advices. In my opinion, FLB patients should, and this is a, a new insight, I talked to it with several orthodontists, it sh could be a recommendation to ask FLB patients to make uh, a, an X-ray of their dentition at a relatively young age, for instance, nine, eight, nine years old, then we you can see if there are too much teeth, which is possible, if you uh, lack teeth, what is the position of your teeth, and then you can think before and can make a plan in case in future, unfortunately, something is happening in the oral facial region uh, with extra bone formation. So monitoring your uh, 
the, the position of your teeth and molars are important mm -hmm. and absolutely if it is possible every half a year to the dentist and in between to the dental hygienist so every three months to a dental office whether it is the dentist or the dental hygienist okay. just to to have this individual advice yeah no that's great great recommendation that's great um, I just posted in the chat, the IFOPA worked with uh, Dr. Friedman and Dr. Eleanor to create a guide on oral health and dentistry. And so I just put in the chat a link to that. So if you're interested in a guide that you could even take with you to your doctor. Um, and then also um, I will post here in just a moment, the link to the FOP treatment guidelines. It's pages 80 through 87 of the guidelines are about oral health that you could print off and share with your physician, with your dentist or oral uh, or the donist or oral surgeon the next time you would need, maybe if you needed to see them. So, okay, there's a couple of questions here in Spanish. So if you'll give me just one moment, I'm going to translate them so that we can ask those questions. Okay, so the question is, once the jaws are locked, is there any way to open them back up? It is there is oh, sorry can you repeat it is there a way to once is there a surgery to open the jaws back up and once the jaws have locked yeah then we have well that's uh future uh in future it we all wish it would be uh, possible to do the surgery to open the mouth under the protection of a drug of a medicament which will prevent uh, recurrence of extra bone formation which is still not the case at this moment so i know that we would love to that in amsterdam the research team would love to do something in that regard in the next years if there is a drug then you can start to think about unlocking the jaw, unlocking an elbow, but not as long as we don't have a drug, uh, it is um, not advisable. Right, and you're absolutely right. So the clinical trials that are occurring now, we talked a lot yesterday about the five clinical trials, the STOP-FOP trial in Amsterdam, the uh, palaveratine trial, the uh, Falcon trial that Ipsen is running, um, the Insight INCB 000928 trial, and then the coming up Regeneron trial, um, the Optima trial, and just how important it is for us to learn if bone growth can be slowed down um, or stopped through one of these treatments. That's the purpose of these trials. And then after those questions are answered about a drug, then that might be the time when we can begin to think about um, doing surgery. But I will say that we have seen, you know, in the published literature, there are some folks that are actually starting to work in mouse models to see if they can give them some of these drugs and do surgery. So I share that to say to the families, don't lose hope. It's, yeah. I know it is something that the researchers are thinking about. It is something that the pharmaceutical companies are thinking about. They, that is the ultimate goal, that in curing FOP. Um, but it will take time and it will take these other drugs being approved first before but, we're uh, able to do something of that magnitude. Yeah, but I can add to this that um, if the mouse is, well, has a restricted mouse opening, there are still a lot of possibilities because uh, specifically prosthodontists are very, very keen in this sort of thing. And together with the digital intraoral scanning you can make models you can make uh, uh, you can do uh, uh, certainly in the front region you can do restorative work you can place some uh, crowns or whatever so even with a restricted mouth opening dentists can just work uh, but you have to go to a specialist uh, dentist, I think. Like Lisa Friedlander, she is making marvelous uh, 
uh, well, devices or uh, uh, re reconstructions uh, for FOP patients. So, and where is Doctor? Where is that doctor located? Oh, she is living in Paris. In Paris, and Doctor okay. Geneviève Boja is referring to her nearly all uh, patients from France uh, with FOP. And we have now together, together with Clive and Lisa and myself, we are discussing these patients online together, which is a very, very nice um, new activity. Now, Eleanor, I thought you were retired. It sounds like you're still <laughs> working a lot on behalf of FOP patients. So uh, yeah, you're yeah. very grateful. But I do not play golf and I do not bridge. So I <laughs> <no. laughs> That's a joke. Uh, well, we're glad no, no. that you're on the FOP team, that you and Tone are both on the FOP team to help our families. That's really, it's really special. So thank you. Okay, let's see. The next question is about plaque. So if there is plaque in the front or behind the teeth, how can yeah. that be eliminated or removed for people with FOP that have small openings? Yeah. Um, that well, there. Are, I think that uh, in your toolkit you have also this very uh, special toothbrushes with one tuft, very a children toothbrush. It could well. That's that's another presentation about all this, uh, uh, all this uh, equipment. Oh no, without uh, adapted uh, tools in in, in dentistry. But again, uh, uh, going to a dental hygienist who can remove dental plaque and calculus at the inside of the of your mouth, and also, which is a problem, is that with the uh, reduced jaw movements, there is uh, less salivary uh, flow, so you have more formation of calculus and plaque. So it is a problem. It is a problem, and and we do not have a, a ready-made solution for it. And we should study more about uh, solutions for uh, for FOP patients. Yep. Oh, I do not hear. Sorry. I'm what, just what's... I'm just posting the. Uh... Okay other link in the chat to the treatment guidelines. So the oral health and dentistry items are there. And then also the other thing to keep in mind, and I'll put this link in there, is that the guidebook, the Ability Toolbox guidebook that Karen Kirkhoff works on also has resources in it for lots of things that are adaptive in nature, but also in this area. So, this is, so those are really great resources for you to have on the website, even if you go to the website and start searching for dentist or dentistry or oral health, you'll find these resources as well. Okay, let me see other, if there are other questions at this time. It may be hard to, to answer this, um, but is there a specific brand of toothpaste you recommend? I know it may be different from country to country. Oh, yes. I can say something about it. I should recommend a toothpaste with not too much flavor uh, because you're uh, for people with FOP the mouth can be sensitive so don't use strong flavors in your uh, 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 toothpaste uh, I've not a preference but that there is um, and if you are really have problems with the the, the taste and the sensitivity of your gums. There are specific uh, toothpaste like Elmex sensitive, and uh, we have a lot of experience with that. And I should recommend just uh, what is what is uh, smacks for? Uh, yeah, flavor, yeah, flavor analytics. Yeah, yeah. So you you have this this uh, some. People like the toothpaste with, well, it it, it is old peppermint or eucalyptus. Don't do that too much. Keep it down. <laughs> okay. 
And there was a follow-up question to the to the fluoride or to the plaque question. If there is no opening at all, if they have no opening, is there any way to remove the plaque and clean the teeth? No, that not as far as I know. But in that case, well, plaque is only vulnerable of is will only give tooth decay if there is sugar around. So if you keep your diet straight, if you're not drinking energy drinks, because it is very, I know, that, and take care, because also in apple juice, there's a lot of sugar. So really, really take care and look at, uh, uh, at the bottle, how much of uh, sugar uh, contains uh, the liquid, how much sugar it contains, and the only thing I can say is that you have to keep a very strict, healthy diet without with as uh, with really, really uh, no, well, no or just a little bit sugar. No sugar drinks, no candies. That's cheese. Uh, that sort of things are very good to eat because the moment you have too much sugar or carbohydrates in your mouth, then plaque will be dangerous. As long as there are no sugar around, plaque cannot turn the tooth of give the tooth decay process. So in that way you can keep it well, you keep your mouth healthy. Okay. I'm going to tweet about that. I had no idea that um, that if you have plaque, it's okay if it's there, if you can't get rid of it. But knowing that the sugar is what makes it dangerous is really important. So we've been posting on Twitter um, and Instagram stories key um, key tidbits of information from the sessions at yesterday and today. So if you need a little recap of something you might have missed, um, feel free to go back to the IFOPA's um, Twitter page or find us on Instagram at Cure uh, FOP, and you'll also see some recaps of the different sessions there as well. So that's really, really good information. Thank you. Oh, and, and Michelle, can I add something about dental plaque? Because also uh, on the issue of dental plaque, new developments, new uh, research is done, and we are now not talking anymore about oral plaque, we're talking about the oral microbiome so it's the there's a whole new area of research in that regard and hopefully there will be we can influence by influencing the oral biome uh, microbiome uh, do uh, take care that the dental plaque is not become um, uh, uh, well can Give the uh, no, not, uh, give the trauma of uh, leads to uh, tooth decay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that makes no. I understand. That makes sense. So there's a question about why is it important to use a toothpaste with fluoride? Maybe you could speak to fluoride a little bit. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, recently, the World Health Organization has officially stated that fluoride is the most important, the, the fluoridated toothpaste has been the most important factor in reducing tooth decay in the past uh, century. So we have uh, fluoridated toothpaste since uh, 1950. Uh, and from then on, uh, there's a lot of research has been done and that is, uh, there is an official uh, World Health Organization statement on fluoridated uh, toothpaste. Okay. So that's that's a, that's a, a very important issue. Yeah. yeah. So someone asked about to, uh, the toothbrush. Um, even for adults living with FOP, if they can't fit a regular size toothbrush in their mouth, is it okay to use a child size toothbrush, or is that preferred? Well, of course. Well, of course. So it's mainly Absolutely. get it in your mouth and you're moving it around. The size doesn't matter. The size doesn't matter. And just moving around, stirring your dental plaque. Uh, don't make it too complicated. Just moving around, taking care that two spaces in your mouth and afterwards not rinsing. 
keep that toothpaste in your mouth so oh. fluoride can do their work afterwards okay what That's we did good earlier uh, uh, rinsing rinsing it's not uh it's uh well we say just a little bit spit it out and keep it in your mouth okay. let the fluoride work for you okay that's really helpful <laughs> okay i'm just checking to see if there's any more questions this has been really great double check in the chat okay i think that might be the end of our question oh Okay, there's a question about the removal of wisdom teeth. Oh, Is yeah. it true if you have wisdom teeth, if you take it out, you need to take out more teeth? So I think the question is related to if you have the surgery to remove your wisdom teeth, could that cause your jaw to close, which would need other teeth to be removed? Well, there, there's, there are new guidelines in the dental world about uh, removing uh, uh, wisdom teeth. It used to be that we that routinely it would be taken out, but that's not anymore the case. But in FOP patients, we have to deal with a different, uh, a different way of thinking. And I think that's what I was talking about when I said that we would like to monitor the position of wisdom teeth in the life of the young adults and if you are uh, looking at the x-rays and you see that uh, there will be an awkward position of the wisdom teeth it will be uh, a good discussion point with the oral surgeon to talk about removal of the wisdom uh, uh no matter the, the wish wisdom teeth yeah yeah the third yeah. molars but um it is not uh if the the last molar, the third molar, is in a good position, and for instance, the first molar is in a very bad decayed uh, situation, you could decide to remove the first molar, and then the the molars behind will slow down forwards, and then you have the problem of the position of wisdom teeth uh resolved solved sorry involved but it uh, it is very important to think in time about what will we do in future with the wisdom teeth mm -hmm. and uh and there there's a lot of experience in that regard in the dental with well among dentists who are familiar with fop okay okay that's helpful um, we have another question about plaque. Is there a rinse or a mouthwash that can help fight plaque? Uh, you can really, yeah, you can. Um, then you are talking about chlorhexidine. Oh, that, that's a chapter in itself also. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you... Um, if you are not able to remove plaque, it can be helpful to uh, just to use mouth rinches. That's okay. It's less effective than the manual removal of dental plaque, but it helps. It supports. That's why not? Okay, let me see here. I'm just posting the, the word, the chlorhexidine mouthwash that you uh, mentioned. I'm oh, but thinking. that is, yeah, but the chlorhexidine is specifically for infection in the gums okay. after a periodontal intervention or if you have a gingivitis uh, after removal of the wisdom teeth. So that is not in connection with dental plaque, it is in connection with infection infection okay and the mouth rinses uh you have mouth rinses with fluoride so you have to look into it in, in your pharmacy you have the mouth rinses with fluoride which is 
in connection to uh, tooth decay and, uh, well, the dental plaque issue. And you have the chlorhexidine, which is in relation to infection of periodontitis and after removing, after extraction of a molar, that you have to clean your mouth and keep it free from infection. Okay, okay perfect. Okay, I think uh, one last call for any other questions. We've covered a lot of ground today. You've answered a lot of questions, but started with the research and what we've learned from patients first, which I really appreciate. Okay. I think that is our last question then. So thank you, Dr. Tone, for the research again, for Dr. Eleanor, for all of your insights um, from your practice and then from your continued work with FOP and staying up to date on what are the most important things for our families.